Well, um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Simon Lockyer. I'm one of the co-founders of Five Good Friends and The Lookout Way. And I'm joined here by Paul Griffin today. Welcome, Paul. Thanks for uh, coming back. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge some of our Retirement Village and Allied Health partners who have joined us uh, today. Thank you very much for uh, sharing in on what we hope will be a really uh, informative discussion with Paul. But of course, our biggest thanks goes to Paul uh, himself. And just by way of background, Paul is an infectious diseases physician and microbiologist. He was appointed as the Director of Infectious Diseases at Marta Health Services in 2013. Uh, he is also a very busy man uh, because in addition he continues appointments as Principal Investigator at Q Farm, which is now called Nucleus Network. He is a visiting scientist uh, at Marta Medical Research Institute and the Queensland Institute of Medical Research and he is also an Associate Professor at the University of Queensland. So Paul is incredibly skilled and knowledgeable uh, in this area and for those of you who have been following it, he has made regular appearances in the media. Uh, providing the community with really easy to understand, concise uh, and objective information. And so given where we are with COVID, we thought it would be a great opportunity to welcome Paul back today um, to, uh, to discuss a few things. Uh, the objective today is for me to talk as little as possible and to ask questions. We've had many questions given to us uh, by our colleagues and by our partners, so we're grateful for that. Um, Paul, we thought we would start though, um, last time when we chatted to you, uh, we sort of gave a bit of a baseline, I guess, and to say what is COVID and what are vaccines and how do they work. We've lived with that now for the last sort of two and a bit years. So that knowledge is in the community. But certainly what we are seeing is a surge in cases again. Uh, and the data that we would see uh, inside uh, our network is that it's worse than what we saw in February and January um, of this year. Could you just provide a little bit of commentary on that? Um, and tell us really a bit about, is it a new variant that we're experiencing, but what actually is going on out in the community? Yeah, look, thank, thanks for having me. They're, they're great questions that you pose and things that are really, you know, being asked all around at the moment. And I think one of the biggest things about COVID right now is, you know, since the start of the pandemic, we were perhaps a little bit over the top in terms of where our, our commentary was and the perception of risk. And then seemingly overnight, we went a little bit too far the other way where we're being a little bit overly reassuring and perhaps not getting the message out there about the, the risk that's still present. And, you know, we know with these uh, repeated peaks in recent times, there's a number of factors that are driving that. Certainly we have seen new variants or even sub-variants that have emerged that have each been successively more infectious than the past. So what we saw in December, January, <coughs> excuse me, was Omicron, which was um, about one and a half times as infectious as Delta. Wow. <coughs> and reassuringly though, it caused less severe disease. But unfortunately, a lot of people then started to say that COVID had become mild and that wasn't actually true. While it was less severe than Delta, it was probably similar in severity to the first variant, uh, the, the original Wuhan strain. And then from there, so we called that original Omicron BA1 then because we had BA2, which was again 30 to 50% more infectious than BA1. And that's what's driven, I guess, a, a few successive waves of transmission, not only in Queensland and Australia, but, but worldwide. So, and that really highlights the fact that, you know, while we're getting better tools and our control has improved over the over this virus and it's been very appropriate to relax a lot of restrictions that we relied on early on, the risk hasn't gone away and it's going to continue to be present as we do see more new variants and sub-variants come through. Yeah, so many people um, became ill this year from COVID and that was despite the fact that they were vaccinated, in most cases double vaccinated. Um, and one of the things that we, we've seen uh, out there in the community is that they're now starting to go, well, I got vaccinated, but I still got it. Um, and that is certainly leading to some question, people understandably questioning boosters and do I need to keep staying up to date uh, with the regimes that are going to be coming out. Can you provide a bit of commentary around that and, and actually, you know, what vaccination meant, even though people became infected? Well, absolutely. And, you know, one of the challenges here is things have changed very quickly. And a lot of people have been critical that we've changed the goalposts in terms of vaccination. But it's really been the virus that's been changing, as I alluded to in the last question. And our, our response has had to change in response to the changes in the virus. So people might recall Delta now seems like a long time ago. Yeah. But what we did is focus on the second dose. So we know 
we, we knew at the time we needed that second dose protection to give what we needed to protect people from Delta. So we brought that forward and focused on that second dose. And in many ways, what we've done with Omicron is similar, but it's been a booster dose. So our protection from two doses against Omicron was reduced to a degree. It wasn't to zero, but it was reduced. And so that's why we became increasingly reliant on that booster. We really needed that third dose to restore our protection back up to what we saw two doses provide against those previous variants. So people might recall that we successively reduced that interval yeah. for that booster to the point where a lot more people became eligible in late January. But with sharp increases in eligibility, the rate of boosters really didn't take off. So we've seen a bit of a plateauing of that. And I think it's for a lot of the reasons you allude to. A lot of people said, well, I still got it, so I don't need the booster. And we know that that's not true. So protection from infection is fairly short-lived in many people and highly variable. So we still need people to get boosted. And the fact that we've seen a lot of cases in vaccinated people is actually a well-recognised paradox for vaccination. So, you know, we've got a population that's now 95% vaccinated the vaccine still reduces your chance of getting infected, but of course it's not to zero. So given our population is nearly all vaccinated, most cases will occur in vaccinated individuals. But that doesn't mean your risk of getting infection isn't reduced because we know that it is. And most importantly, the consequences of each and every one of those infections is very significantly reduced. So those people then become much more likely to have mild or asymptomatic infection, gotcha. which again is demonstration of the effect of the vaccine. Yeah. Not a failing, but many people have said, well, most people are mild, so I won't worry about it. And the trouble is, as we see these new variants and subvariants and recombinants emerge, we're going to rely on that protection increasingly moving forward. And the other thing that's really highlighting the importance of vaccination moving forward is we've reduced a lot of the other things we've been doing to protect people. And we've done that quite quickly in recent times. We've seen international and domestic borders open appropriately, of course. We've seen mask mandates be wound back and a lot of other measures. So now we're really relying almost solely on vaccination, as well as testing and hopefully the voluntary use of masks. So if anything, vaccination has become more important. But I think that hasn't been emphasised enough as we've been reassuring people, maybe a little excessively, that it's appropriate to wind back those other restrictions. Yeah. And just to join some of your earlier commentary with that, uh, with, with your answer there. Um, so Omicron was actually uh, a nastier for, you know, in layman's terms, uh, form of the virus. Uh, people who became infected with it, but they, when they were vaccinated, that's actually just a great argument for vaccination, full stop, isn't it? In that it, it, it reduced the severity of the disease. A absolutely. I mean, when we compare Omicron and Delta, Omicron definitely causes less severe disease, a reduced rate of hospitalizations, a reduced rate of deaths. But what people have failed to appreciate is our rate of increase of cases has been extreme with Omicron. So that even though, relatively speaking, it's rarer or less likely to go to hospital or die because there's so many more cases, the actual rate of those complications has increased. So, you know, the, the biggest uh, month in terms of mortality in Australia was actually January and it looks like we're going to beat that again. So the case numbers are really high. So even though relatively speaking, it's less common, the consequences are still very significant. And I think that's underappreciated at the moment as well. Yeah, okay. um, we're hearing also out in the community, uh, people now who've had COVID two and maybe three times. What happens with reinfection, uh, even if you are vaccinated, 95% of the population are? What actually happens to you as a person and the disease that you experience? Yeah, we know a lot of people were, were thinking that once you're infected, that was it. But we know protection, as I mentioned earlier, can be quite short lived in many people. And if we look at comparing protection from vaccination versus infection, from vaccination, we give a very controlled dose that we know gives you a good response that lasts a reasonable period of time. With infection, it's highly variable. So some people might get exposed to a, a fair bit of virus and get a good response, but others might not. And so that's why we can't rely on protection from infection. And one of the really important messages is once you've recovered from your infection, you should return to your vaccine schedule. So if you were due for a booster and you got COVID, defer it while you're still unwell, but as soon as you're well, go back to getting your booster right. because we, we need that additional top up in the broad protection you get from vaccination to prevent you getting infected moving forward, but also to continue to reduce the chance of severe disease. So um, it's really important that people understand that. And so on that point of boosters, um, how many more boosters are we likely to have? Is this... You know, you spoke really well when we spoke last time about living with COVID. Are we likely to see boosters just coming out um, in line with the flu season or in line with known times where there will be peaks uh, in the virus? 
It's, it's a great question. And we see a lot of people, you know, there's obviously a lot of sentiment out there that we, we don't want to vaccinate people every four months. So, so while we brought forward this booster this first time, really to combat Omicron and what we were seeing with transmission, nobody's proposing a four monthly booster. That wouldn't be reasonable, sensible, practical or possible, I think. Um, we've seen recently the announcement of a so-called winter booster or a fourth dose for people that are the most vulnerable because we are seeing still lots of transmission and we are a bit concerned that maybe things will take off again in winter. Um, but then having said that, we know this, this virus isn't truly seasonal like the flu because we've already seen two big peaks in our summer months. So there's a lot more to it than that. I think boosters moving forward are clearly going to be something we're going to rely on because we, we know that even after three doses, despite excellent protection, it's not going to be lifelong. So there will be another booster required, but we don't have a plan for that yet because it's not required now. And what we're going to do is continue to look at new and emerging variants, what happens with number of cases and the proportion of severe disease. And so our um, next booster will be like we've done with the first three, is it'll respond to the situation at the time and, and kind of crystal balling a little bit. And as I say, there's no plans for this right now. I actually expect it to be sort of six to nine months for most people, which will take us probably to the, you know, the end of winter. Um, but again, it will depend on what happens in winter. The, the main thing is it's, it's a bit confusing for a lot of people now. And so I'd recommend people speak to their GP or vaccine provider about their eligibility. And you know, we're also seeing people with medical problems become eligible sooner, including that, that so-called winter booster. So if you do have a long-term medical problem, speak to your specialist or whoever manages that yeah. about whether you're eligible and when best to get that. Yeah, okay. So um, we were chatting a little bit before um, today and we talked about now we've got three sort of readily available um, vaccines or two readily available vaccines. And that now is really starting to remove um, the risk of people not being able to have the vaccine. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, look, I, a lot of people have debated whether we've done the right thing with vaccines in this country, but I think we've done a tremendous job to have, in fact, four really good options at the moment for people. So um, people might recall we had AstraZeneca and you know that's being used a bit less and less for a variety of reasons. We have two excellent mRNA vaccines in Pfizer and Moderna, pretty similar, but um, with some slightly different properties. And then the most recent development, of course, has been Novavax, um, which has been approved uh, initially as a primary vaccination. Of course, there weren't many people left, so it's not been utilised a lot. But we will get that approved soon, hopefully, as a booster more broadly. But in, in fact, for people that can't have one of the other three vaccines as their booster, they can actually get Novavax for that now. And the good thing about that vaccine, and you know, all four are obviously very safe and effective, or they wouldn't be approved and in use in our country, but Novavax is a different platform to the others. So if people have been concerned or had issues with viral vectors, the cases with AstraZeneca or mRNA with Pfizer and Moderna, Novavax is a much simpler vaccine. So it's right. just a, a protein vaccine where we make that spike protein in the lab and we just inject that. So it's kind of tried and tested method um, and uh, again, has had exceptional results in clinical trials. So, so that's another, vaccine that's available. So what that basically means is there's essentially nobody that can't have one of those vaccine options. So again, I think we've done a good job of that in this country. Yeah, great. Um, and what new treatments are being developed and will we see come over the horizon in the next sort of 12 to 18 months, two years? I think this has been one of the other big success stories of the pandemic is just how many options we have to treat people. Of course, they've fluctuated in terms of how well they've worked as we've had new challenges thrown at us from the virus in terms of different variants. But we've um, got so many great tools to be able to treat people now. The, the main ones, I guess, for this audience is we have two really good oral direct acting antivirals. At the moment, they're approved for people who are high risk for, for a variety of reasons. But then we can give those medicines to people shortly after they test positive and it greatly reduces your chance of progressing to severe disease, needing to go to hospital, etc. And in fact, that highlights one of the challenges in us still measuring the pandemic in the same way in terms of hospitalisations and ICU, is we're now giving people all these medicines, which is keeping us incredibly busy, but because they're effective, less of those people are going onto those endpoints. So it looks like they're the same, whereas in fact, upstream of that, things are even more uh, intense. But those therapies work tremendously well. So again, people at the moment need to be at risk. So if you do have a medical problem, speak to your GP or specialist about your eligibility. So that can be, I guess, pre-planned. But we also have, um, for example, a long-acting injectable antibody we can give to people. So there are still people whose immune systems don't work. 
who no matter how many vaccines we give, they won't respond. But we can now give them this antibody, which gives them almost immediate protection that lasts six months. So it essentially does the job of being vaccinated. So that's a really great tool as well we can now use to protect the most vulnerable in our population. So there's a lot happening, and I know I rushed through that very quickly, but it just means there are lots of, lots of options. So if you're someone who's concerned, definitely speak to whoever's looking after you about those. I think you were saying earlier there's 125 different vaccinations or vaccines in development or treatment at the moment. So um, what will that mean visiting the GP in the future? Will they be prescribing things uh, like they do for existing medications at the moment? Yeah, we're going to see this continue to expand and, and a lot of this expansion is still exponential. So on the vaccine front, yeah, there's 125 vaccines in clinical trials. And so soon we'll have what's going to be called so-called second generation vaccines. And the idea behind a lot of these, and it doesn't detract at all from the safety or the efficacy of the vaccines we've been using, but they're clearly not perfect. And so there's a whole lot of properties we're striving for. The, the biggest one, of course, is a, a reduced susceptibility to, to the efficacy being reduced by new variants, meaning that even if we do get new variants, another variant of concern whenever that happens, that some of these vaccines will still work, yeah. even though our existing ones might be reduced a little bit, like we saw, I guess, yeah. with Omicron. So there's heaps of those coming through. There's some exciting vaccines given via alternate routes. Yeah. Um, you know, needle and syringe works well, but has some limitations. So there's a really exciting intranasal one that I'm still trialling locally. Uh, and the idea behind intranasal, for example, is you get a response where the, the virus gets in and hopefully that'll reduce that even further. So wow. the vaccine front is going to keep expanding, uh, which is great over the course of, uh, you know, maybe the coming weeks, even we might get another option. And there'll be more and more therapies as well, as well as an expansion of the way we use the existing therapies, the, the tablets that we're using to treat the highest risk people right now will hopefully soon be available for people who don't have an extra high risk yeah. of progressing, and they might even be able to be used to prevent infection if people are exposed. So again, we're getting more and more tools. So our expectation around control should continue to be high, but it doesn't replace vaccination. Yeah. And if we don't get that bit right, we are gonna keep seeing big problems. Gotcha. Um, shifting gears uh, a little, you know, care organisations work with incredibly vulnerable members of our um, society, vulnerable to COVID. Um, you know, we have started to relax a lot of the restrictions like you've, you've talked about. Um, but we need to work with these people. We still have PPE requirements um, that are put upon uh, the safe delivery of services by regulators and by the government. Can you just give us a little bit of advice about that, about, you know, maintaining our rigour with PPE uh, and working with, with vulnerable people? You yeah, look, this is, of course, something that's been a, a rapidly changing environment. And, you know, I think for a while we had a few too many rules and regulations in place. I certainly was advocating for the relaxation of the close contact rules for some time, because yeah. I think that's now offering very little and coming at a significant cost. PPE, on the other hand, is something that really doesn't come at much of a cost. Um, and, you know, obviously there's been a lot of discussions about how effective it is, but we know that masks work, for example, yeah. and they protect not only the wearer, but people around you as well. So I certainly am a big fan of masks um, and I continue to encourage their use on a voluntary basis. So I don't think we're going to need mandates, nor should we have them, but I think we need to still use masks. And we know some countries have done this really well. If you hop on a public transport and you're not wearing a mask, people will criticise you here. It's almost the opposite in many ways. And, and I think that's where our, um, um, we need to have a bit of a mind shift there and, and really increase our use of some of those things. So I think mask wearing is something we should just get accustomed to moving forward. And you know, whether it remains mandatory in certain settings or not, that'll probably change over time, right. but it's still a good thing to do. And as I say, protects you and protects people around you. Yeah, okay. Um, the other thing we're starting to hear a lot about, you know, there's articles in uh, the weekend magazines is about long COVID um, and people who are now experiencing that. Can you provide a bit of commentary on it? What is it and what do we know about it now? Yeah, it's one of the big things we're talking about at the moment because we still don't know a lot about it. I mean, it would be great if we could work out who was likely to get it and more importantly, do something to prevent that. And, you know, at the moment, the only thing that's been shown to make a big difference is vaccination. So, I mean, if you don't get COVID, you can't get long COVID. Um, and the, the, that's great the, logic. <laughs> the, 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 the studies are coming out increasingly that vaccinated people are less likely to progress to some of those longer term symptoms. And, you know, there, there are varying uh, estimates of proportion. Some have said maybe even 50% of those infected will have some kind of symptom out to weeks or months afterwards. And, you know, that might be mild, like a dry lingering cough or a bit of fatigue. 
But when you've got that in such high proportions, the burden of that is still very significant and, and worthy of prevention, of course, by, by getting vaccinated. And, and so there is a lot of good work happening there in terms of diagnosing it better and maybe predicting it and maybe intervening. But at the moment, all, all we can really say is that it's another really strong case for getting as many people vaccinated as possible. And just on that point, uh, this is anecdotal, um, but what we are seeing is um, some elderly people who are recovering from COVID, they're testing negative, but then maybe in the weeks afterward, they are going on to develop a secondary um, infection. Not so much long COVID, but we've had reports of pneumonia and things like that. Um, are we seeing more evidence of that happening in the community? Yeah, absolutely. We, we know secondary infections can follow any viral infection, um, but certainly with COVID, it's perhaps a little bit less in terms of frequency than, than say, influenza. But given the numbers of COVID cases we're seeing, that still translates to a significant proportion of people uh, getting those secondary bacterial infections. So it is important that if you get any symptoms after you've uh, had COVID, and certainly if things are looking like they're heading in the wrong direction, certainly get seen by your by your doctor. Don't don't assume it's just COVID because there are things we can do for some of those. Um, secondary consequences like bacterial infection but yeah it is something that, that is happening and again you know if we when we try and think about combating infectious diseases it's good to do that as upstream as possible and so intervening to prevent the COVID in the first place is still the the best option yeah. of course we have uh, vaccines also for for a common germ that causes pneumonia in terms of the pneumococcal vaccine or the pneumonia vaccine so um, if there are people who are in the eligible groups for that I'd encourage them to make sure they're up to date with their other vaccines yeah. as well okay and are there any new high risk groups that we've identified? Um, you know, again, when COVID started, um, diabetes, for example, uh, people with that were identified as being high risk. Are there any new sort of underlying morbidities that people have now that we are two and a half years into this that we've identified as being at risk? Yeah, so I guess the biggest one now, the biggest shift from, you know, early on is that now we're seeing those consequences being, you know, truly overrepresented in the unvaccinated. So, okay. so that's perhaps our biggest risk group. And, you know, for a lot of young people who might not have those traditional risk factors, they thought, uh, well, there's been a lot of discussion that they thought they didn't need to get vaccinated because their risk was so low. Whereas, in fact, even young, fit and well people, if they remain unvaccinated, can still progress to severe disease. So if we take out vaccination, those same risk factors still largely apply. And it's, you know, nearly every medical comorbidity puts you at some risk, but age is still a very significant risk with that as well, which is why um, that's how we've rolled out that so-called winter booster for the most vulnerable in terms of conditions that turn down your immune system, yeah. but also the elderly people over 65, for example, and Indigenous people over 50 who are you know, all recognised to be um, quite vulnerable. That's why we've got that fourth dose program for them. Yeah, OK. Um, and look, finally, what is your most salient piece of advice for us to take and to share with the community and to share in our organisation and to share with people um, that, we're, that we're caring for? I think it's about how we think about COVID at the moment. And I think it's about getting the perception of risk just right. Yeah. I think too much early on we were overdoing it. And so there's a lot of fear and panic and people were quite anxious about COVID. And we certainly don't want to encourage that. And then almost seemingly overnight, we flipped to being overly reassured to the point where a lot of people think it's gone away and doesn't pose a risk at all anymore. And, you know, we just need that perception of risk just right. So we get everybody vaccinated. We still get tested if you have symptoms. Um, and we use masks on a voluntary basis to reduce your risk and everyone else's. And if we do that, then this so-called living with COVID becomes a very realistic option. Um, and not letting it rip, like some of the commentary has been as well, that we're just ignoring it and letting it take its toll. We certainly don't want to do that. We're not uh, underappreciating that there's a lot of people who are still anxious out there, that we're not doing enough to protect them. And so we need to get that just right. And as I say, vaccination, testing if you have symptoms and staying home till you're no longer infectious, and wearing your mask, that's how we're going to move forward, as well as obviously utilising those therapies to their fullest capacity, and we're doing more in that space. But this isn't going to go away. And so we need to get those basics right so that we can minimise the impact moving forward and ideally get back to as close to normal as possible. So we're not suggesting there's going to be lockdowns and other dr drastic measures required moving forward. But we can't take those off the table if we don't get those basics right. So, so as I say, it's about risk perception, getting it just right, not panicking, but not ignoring it. Fantastic. Now, we're very lucky to have someone as skilled uh, as Paul here and with the expertise that Paul has. Are there any questions uh, from the floor that people would like to ask Paul about COVID and what our future looks like? Yes, Nathan. Um, just one, we're starting to see people get the Simon Said COVID over and over again. 
Um, are you seeing, is there any more uh, compounding negative impacts on people if they get COVID once, or is it sort of every spin is independent, essentially, um, and it, it, there's no additional risk? Yeah, so with successive infections like that, we typically would expect to see some protection from the first one and depends on many variables in terms of that person's risk and how far apart they are. Typically, the next one is less severe, but it's not always the case. And some people can have a, a, a very mild infection and progress to a more significant one the next time around. So again, it's why we can't just assume that once you've had it, don't worry about it. We need to get people vaccinated. We need to take each time you get it seriously. around um, like you know I've been out and about but yet I haven't picked up COVID is there a cohort of people where they're almost immune to it yeah, so the question's about whether, you know, people can uh, can somehow be immune to it. And of course, yes, that's what the vaccine does. So, um, and we're getting that question a lot. We'll see, you know, early on, we would almost assume that everyone in a household would be positive if someone in the household was positive. But now there's so many anecdotes, myself included, where family members get positive, but then a number of them don't. And the main way that happens is through vaccination, of course. Um, and, and that's what we're seeing in the population as well, as there are lots of people. I mean, basically everybody has encountered this virus by now. There's no one who wouldn't have been exposed in some some way by this point in time but there are a lot of people who haven't got it and, and that really is a strength of vaccination in terms of other things that can contribute well masks and social distancing some of those simple measures can also contribute but yeah the main thing is vaccination we've, we've got a question from the listeners yes um paul i know it's probably not consistent for everybody but the question is how long does the vaccination tend to give cover um for for most people um after two shots and, and boosters yeah, so in terms of how long the vaccine lasts, it's a little bit variable. Um, and there's been so much discussion about waning antibody levels. And that's what a lot of people have heard about. Um, and that is true. That is something that happens. But what we know is that protection generated by these vaccines is far greater than just antibodies. And in fact, while we've obviously needed a booster with Omicron, the protection from severe disease declines much less slowly. So that's likely to be six, nine, maybe even 12 months, maybe longer, that people will still get the benefits of being protected from severe disease by, by three doses of vaccines against Omicron. Reinfection is probably more about those antibody levels, and they do tend to wane over a period of months. So maybe six, nine months, they might be fairly low. But in fact, we're still getting a lot of that data because you know, great data, we needed that third dose to combat Omicron. But now in terms of how long that lasts, that's what we're generating at the moment. So yeah, I'd say... Simple answer is six to 12 months, but it's a bit different with antibodies and severe disease. Thank you. Fantastic. Are there any more questions? Any questions from people on Zoom? The question is around funding for treatments. Um, I know obviously when um, COVID first hit, the billions of dollars being flushed out for investment in treatments. What's, what are you seeing in the industry now and the scientific community around funding for treatments? Has it continued to maintain that momentum or is it dwindling? Yeah, so funding for scientific research relating to COVID has, you know, it's been one of the big success stories and one of the reasons we have got vaccines, um, therapies and, you know, a greater understanding of the virus is, is there is still a lot of really good funding. So, you know, our understanding of all those things is expanding really rapidly. I guess the main thing is those two new oral therapies have been completely paid for by the government. So they're PBS listed, um, which was a huge investment because uh, they're, they're not cheap, but the, uh, the benefits are obviously there, which is why they've been funded. But we are getting lots more scientific discoveries happening all the time and there is still generous funding for that, which is, uh, which is obviously great. Fantastic. Well, I think um, we'll draw that to a close. Would you please um, join me in uh, thanking Paul uh, for coming in today? Um, we are incredibly lucky and grateful that you've given up uh, your time, Paul. You are in hot demand in the media and also have an amazing career and do incredibly great work uh, with the community um, and uh, in your roles at, uh, at the MARTA. So thank you for finding time uh, for us and um, we look forward to uh, hopefully being able to call you in again as this uh, journey we go on takes a new twist. Thank you and thanks for having me and thanks for listening.